Welcome everyone. This presentation is the Upper Columbia River and Snake Rivers north of Falcon, also known as Northeast of McNary, presentation that is typically held in three locations in eastern Washington. Those include Wenatchee, Tri-Cities, and Clarkston. However, due to the COVID-19 epidemic, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is not hosting any public meetings and so has opted to provide an alternative method to provide forecasts and fishery presentations for public commenting through the form of this video. So moving on, this is the agenda we'll be walking through for the rest of this presentation. We'll have staff introductions, then we'll move on to the North of Falcon schedule and how to provide comments, managing the salmon steelhead and how it involves in other forums and jurisdictions, and also to meet conservation objectives. Then we'll walk through the 2020 forecast and recent year returns for key stocks. Then the next bullet is a reminder of what fisheries occurred in 2019 for reference. Intent of this is to also walk through the 2020 forecasts and proposed seasons that for under consideration that we would like to receive your public comment on. Um, so starting off with introductions, I will be given the majority of this presentation. Um, I am Ryan Lothrop, the Columbia River Fishery Manager out of the Olympia office and headquarters. Chris Donnelly, Region 1 Fish Program Manager. Hi, my name is Chad Jackson. I am the Region 2 Fish Program Manager. I'm Darren Friedel, Region 3 Fish Program Manager in South Central Washington. All right, here's the schedule for the North of Falcon and PFMC meeting schedule. Um, beginning March 16th, uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife ceased all public meetings due to the COVID-19 outbreak and has held them in various forums throughout uh, using technology such as conference calls, webinars, and videos such as this. So typically we would have already held Northeast McNary meeting, but it was rescheduled to provide time for staff to develop this presentation and get your comments back. And so that's what uh, this presentation is for March 30th. Um, there's, a meet, there's a meeting also upcoming March 31st for Puget Sound Coast and the Ocean Meeting, which is their second one of the year. Um, April 1st, there is the Lower Columbia River and Ocean Meeting and their second one as well. And then the final stage in developing salmon seasons, um, summer and fall Chinook fisheries and coho um, occurs at the Pacific Fishery Management Council. However, that will be held through a webinar, so you will want to uh, reference the Pacific Fishery Management Council website to follow along in that process. All right, so provide the link here where you can access and find all the materials uh, shared with the public at these various public meetings or webinars and conference calls that have occurred. So if you go to this website, you can find those. You can also find the forecasts as well as um, what's important is the public commenting. All right, so let's get started here. On this slide here, you can see a um, visual of the Pacific Northwest all the way up to Can Alaska and Canada. And what this is showing is the, are the uh, variety of jurisdictional um, processes that help manage salmon fisheries and steelhead fisheries as well, um, but primarily salmon. And so you have uh, fish returning uh, to the mid-upper Columbia and the snake that migrate the ocean and are caught in uh, many of these uh, fisheries occur in different states and um, up and off Canada and Alaska. Um, to help meet these conservation objectives um, and provide fishing opportunities for everyone, these forums help provide and set the tone and guidance and directive. So uh, the Pacific Salmon Treaty um, focuses on uh, the U.S.-Canada uh, sharing agreement and um, conservation um, burden. The Pacific Fishery Management Council is a process that I'll describe in a little more detail, but it uh, involves Washington to California, includes state and treaty tribal fisheries. U.S. v. Washington focuses on Puget Sound and coastal uh, waters within Washington. U.S. v. Oregon focuses on within the Columbia River includes states of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and the Treaty Tribes. All right, so for the Pacific Salmon Treaty, um, this involves states, tribal, non-tribal, federal government, the U.S. and Canada, um, includes states of Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and California. 
Um, the objective there is to meet the conservation objectives and to provide equitable fishery opportunities um, and sets the limits for fishery uh, impacts per entity um, between US and Canada. And then, so the second bullet point here is Pacific Fishery Management Council. That's one of eight fishery management councils established by the Magnets and Fishery Conservation and Management Act of 1976. Um, includes jurisdiction off the U.S. off the state shore, so from three to 200 miles offshore, manages commercial, recreational, and tribal fisheries for uh, a lot more species than just salmon, but it also includes ground fish, um, pelagic species, such as rockfish, highly migratory species, such as tuna. So within the salmon world, uh, we have what's known as the north of Falcon and south of Falcon, and that is a geographical break off Cape Falcon and Oregon. So you're, we are mostly in this form uh, more focused on north of Falcon. Um, it also involves this impacts between the ocean and uh, river uh, fisheries. And coming out of the first Pacific Fishery Management Council, the ocean option set uh, three alternatives traditionally. Um, basically a low, medium, and high option with various tools that can be applied to the final option that is selected at the second Pacific Fishery Management Council, which uh, for 2020 is April 3rd through the 10th. So we have a couple of uh, treaty rights um, that we adhere to the court proceedings. Um, U.S. v. Washington is commonly known as the Bolt Decision. Um, this involved Puget Sound and Coastal Tribes treaty rights. Um, it involved 50-50 uh, sharing of harvestable fish. That does not necessarily mean ESA impacts though. And then there's the co-management process that was developed so each um, tribe was able to manage their own fishery. And then they are directly tied in the Pacific Fishery Management Council. And so is actually U.S. v. Oregon. So within U.S. v. Oregon, um, that um, is no longer an open court case. However, um, at the time um, prior to it um, not being an open court case, it was the longest withstanding court um, began back in 1969 and involves the tribes that include Yakima, Nez Perce, Umatilla, and Warm Springs. It, what it does is uh, through the management agreement developed, which has a 10-year plan, um, sets the allocation of ESA and allowable catch impacts between the non-treaty and treaty sectors. Also includes hatchery broodstock uh, objectives, goals, and, and sharing um, obligations and has various committees um, to help inform policy decision makers and actively um, manage fisheries actually and provide guidance. Um, one committee is TAC, so the Technical Advisory Committee that develops forecasts and provides in-season run size updates. So in the last slide here in jurisdictions, um, we have a, a variety of suites of uh, jurisdictions, but they're ever important. First are the WDFW and ODFW policies set by the commission. And these are policies um, and rules in Oregon that detail commercial and recreational allocation, for example, of ESA impacts. Um, also recreational geographic allocation, such as spring Chinook and summer Chinook within the sectors. So then we have the Wampum Ban, which is a legislative law in 1939 providing um, fish for that uh, local community. And then the third on the list is the WDFW and Colville Share Agreement. This is a formal agreement um, between the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and Colville Confederated Tribes to provide uh, fish for the tribe. Also describes some um, management guidance. And uh, why this is, is important is actually Colvilles are not part of the USV Oregon treaty rights, and so their impacts are part of the Washington non-treaty impacts. So this sets the guidance in managing and providing uh, fishing opportunities for the tribe. Then lastly, we have ESA, so the Endangered Species Act. This, is, this provides permit, essentially, to have allowable impacts to prosecute recreational fisheries, for example, and we must stay at or below these, these caps. The rates are provided to pose no jeopardy towards achieving uh, the recovery of these species, 
and also to be aware that there are uh, different triggers um, per different uh, permits out there, but we also have a couple major categories of concern. So you have endangered um, status and a threatened status. Um, endangered is uh, much more critical, and so it has a much lower impact rate, um, such as Snake River sockeye. Um, while uh, Snake River Wild Fall Chinook that return to the Snake River are just threatened and they have uh, increased allowable impacts that can occur. This is the forecast and return section. So we're going to start off with upriver spring Chinook. These are adult uh, spring Chinook returning to mid upper uh, Columbia and Snake River. Um, Snake River is the key stock represents the majority of the fish returning. Um, run timing um, for the 50% passage of Bonneville has uh, progressively moved uh, later. Um, is now around May 7th, but the historical 50% uh, run time is about April 27th. Uh, the 2020 forecast is very similar to the 2019 return, which is above the very low returns that occurred in the 1990s. You can see in the early 2000s, when the ocean conditions improve, we also had improved uh, in-river stream flows through the hydro system for passage, and habitat uh, recovery efforts occurred, which appear to align and provide um, the good returns, the very, very strong returns in the early 2000s that uh, provided fishing opportunities that we still are um, fishing from today. So next up, we have the Upper Columbia Summer Chinook. These are fish destined to above Priest Rapids. Um, They've been rebuilding since 2001, as you can see on this figure. Um, Chief Joseph uh, Hatchery provides additional uh, returns um, with the first mark release in 2014. Again, you'll see 2020 forecast is very similar to last year's return. And again, we had the strong rebound in the early 2000s when the ocean conditions improved and other efforts uh, provided um, support for these larger returns. All right, moving on to Columbia River sockeye. Um, these include stocks such as the endangered uh, Snake River stock. The, also then you have uh, Okanagan stock, which has seen a dramatic increase in productivity up there. Uh, Wenatchee stocks provide some fisheries in the, in the lake as well. As, um, and we also actually have the Yakima and Deschutes River, which are uh, very small components of the forecast but have been uh, reintroduced. And so typically about 60 to 9% of this forecast or previous year runs um, return to the upper Columbia Basin. Um, so you can see the forecast is 246,000, which is substantially higher than the last three years returns. Um, not as, as high as some of the few years prior returns, but it's a relatively good forecast. Um, sockeye are, are more difficult difficult fish to forecast, but again, there's always some level of uncertainty with forecasting. Um, however, this is a strong age class and typically sockeye are cyclical with uh, four-year age class groups. All right, here we have a fall chinook forecast. Um, total fall chinook forecast to the Columbia River mouth is 457,000 fish compared to um, a return of 391,000 last year. Um, these include the uh, upriver brights, which are the key component of this return, um, which are in, um, contributed by the Hanford Reach and Snake River. On average, the upriver components represent about 80% of the total return. All right, so moving on to the upriver bright fall chinook forecast. Our forecast is also up again. We saw an increased run last year than what was predicted, and this year's forecast is ever so slightly higher at 233,000 fish. These include stocks uh, basically to Shoots River on upstream with the Hanford Reach and Snake River fish providing the largest component of the returns. All right, so for the Columbia River Coho forecast to the river mouth, this year's forecast is 144,800, which is substantially lower than last year's forecast. As you can see, had a low return of 170,000. What essentially occurred here is the ocean conditions um, turns sour on us out there in the ocean. Um, we had strong jack returns 
So they return a year old um, prior to the adult component, and we saw really good jack returns. So that window between jack and the adult stage is where we had a high degree of mortality. Um, the stock components include early and late stocks. So the early stocks migrate south in the ocean, and the late stocks migrate north to feed. The majority of the upriver fish are unclipped in early stock coho. So here we have the A index summer steelhead forecast, which for 2020 is 85,900 fish. This includes stocks upstream of the Hood and Wind River. So that includes Yakima, Snake River, and upstream of Priest Rapids Dam, um, with the majority of fish returning to the Snake River. Um, the data here is reflective of passage over Bonneville from April through October. The decline in 2014 is primarily due to poor ocean conditions. So this is a um, forecast similar to last few year, year's returns, which is quite a bit lower than what we've seen over the 2000s, 2010s. All right, here's the last forecast slide. This is the B index summer steelhead, um, which includes hatchery and wild. This includes fish primarily returning to the Clearwater River. Um, these are the larger um, steelhead you see out there, um, reside in the ocean, typically an additional year than the A index fish. Um, the 2020 forecast is under 10,000 at 9,600, which is um, ever so slightly above the previous year's returns, which is quite a bit lower than what we'd like to see like we had in the 2000s and to, even into the 2010s. Um, data reflects, again, passage from April to October. Um, poor ocean conditions are contributing to these very poor returns, which led to rolling block closures um, throughout the um, Columbia and Snake River systems. All right, here um, you see quite a few photos of sea lions, um, some northern pike, minnow, um, fish that um, died during the warm water conditions, and some birds. Um, I guess what we're trying to provide here is that it is understood by WDFW and, and other entities that uh, mortality does occur in the freshwater environment. Um, as I mentioned, ranges from drought events like the 20, what occurred in 2015. We have per direct portation on smolts and adults uh, through bird predation on smolts primarily and pinniped predation, Californians, um, California's and stellar sea lions and predation um, also by northern pike minnow. So we have some programs out there to help with that, um, like the Northern Pike Minnow Reward Program. Also, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife took a significant role to seek additional authorization within the Lower Columbia River to manage California sea lions, as well as add to the level of management and that we have authority for stellar sea lions as well. Permits for this have been pursued, and uh, we do have, and are currently taking steps to further address this issue. So more to come on this in the future. All right, so moving on to the NOAA stoplight chart. This shows the good and the bad um, suite of variables in the ocean that affect our salmon and steelhead stocks when they're entering the ocean in that first year when they're extremely vulnerable to poor food conditions, predation, um, warm water, um, as the fish migrate out there to try to grow into mature adults to return back to our natal systems. So red means bad, yellow means not great, but not horrible, and green means good. And each number is correlated, or is corresponding to the rank. So if you take a close look, you can see where certain variables rank compared to other years in the data set from 1998 through 2019. So you can see the bad ocean conditions and good ocean conditions are cyclical. They come and go through decadal oscillation. You know, basically, like El Ninos are bad for our fish that are returning to Washington, and La Ninas are good. So nice cold water provides good forage supply um, for um, growing salmon and steelhead. Warm waters produce poor food, for example. So what we're trying to show here is these are correlated to what actually returns to our river. Um, a, lot of mature, a lot of mortality does occur in the ocean in that first year when they enter the salt. So 
when you have good conditions, you have very large runs like uh, 2016, um, we had nearly a million fall Chinook enter the Columbia River versus last year where we have, you know, only a couple hundred thousand to 300,000 returning. So quite a bit difference and the ocean conditions um, do help determine that return size. So what we have here is a list of fishery locations and season dates that occurred last year during 2019. Um, so you have reference when you're taking into consideration what the 2020 fishery proposals are and what to provide comments on. As you're probably well aware of, many of these fisheries are managed by using emergency rules in season and were modified based on catches, estimated run sizes, and ESA impacts accrued. So for the 2020 forecast and proposed seasons, uh, as we walk through the forecast, you probably noticed they were very similar to last year's returns and even the year before's returns in 2018. So shouldn't be a surprise that some of the 2020 fishery proposals are similar to the last two years. Uh, of note for upriver spring Chinook with a forecast of 81,700, that is 43% of the 10 year average, which of which of that 81,700, 56,400 return to the snake and 2,800 are projected return to the Yakima and to be determined in ice cool and be uh, monitoring to see if they can meet brood stock. Upper Columbia River summers, uh, again, a similar run size and the target is um, after fisheries to have 29,000 fish um, available to um, pass through the Columbia River and uh, return to the upriver. Um, so that's a 29,000 escapement goal to the Columbia River mouth. Sockeye as a two, you know slightly below 250,000 forecast with Okanagan at 201,800 and Lake Wenatchee at 39,400. And upriver bright fall Chinook has 233,400 of which Hanford reaches the largest component of 90, almost 93,000 fish, of which 65,000 are natural origin. And Snake River is 29,800. All right, so moving on to the 2020 forecast and proposed seasons for below Bonneville fisheries for the sport fishery. Um, Spring Chinook has a low river forecast of 54,100, which is also low. Um, uh, much like upriver stocks. Um, the plan was to open up above the Lewis River only due to uh, Lewis and Callet's uh, return escapement issues and switching to three days per week beginning April 1st uh, with a one sample limit. However, due to COVID-19 concerns, uh, this fishery is temporarily closed. Summer Chinook, uh, not expecting a directed fishery, but there will be impacts um, targeting possible uh, steelhead sockeye in the summer time frame. For sockeye, the intent is to plan fisheries based on the larger forecast and manage in season, which the run size could go up or down. Um, the Wenatchee return were below escapement goals the previous couple of years. Um, however, this year they are above the goal. For fall Chinook, we have a forecast of almost 80,000 uh, Chinook to the lower river. Um, the upriver bright Snake River wild fall Chinook is expected to be the constraining ESA stock again, for the, and it has been for the last couple of years. Um, the plan is to manage to the lower harvest rate, which is 8.25% prior to the run update, um, so that if the run comes in below 200,000, as you recall, the forecast was 233,400, then ESA um, impacts would not be exceeded and if the forecast comes in above then fisheries would be modified and allow the fish uh, additionally up to the 15 percent allowable harvest rate. For coho we have a very low forecast so very limited opportunities where most of the harvest would occur within buoy 10 but there are available ESA impacts to prosecute those fisheries and additionally barbless hooks are required in concurrent waters with Oregon and Washington when fishing for salmon and steelhead. So moving upstream um, from Bonneville Dam upstream to Highway 395 at Pasco, also known as Zone 6, has a uh, spring salmon season starting April 1 through May 5th, which uh, tributaries such as Drano would align with a one fish limit. Um, however, it's temporarily closed due to COVID-19. Summer Chinook uh, wouldn't have any direct impacts, um, so no directed harvest. However, there'll be bycatch when um, fishing for steelhead or sockeye. 
for sockeye, I already walked through it in the lower river. Um, same intent is to uh, plan a fishery and manage in season. Fall Chinook, same constraints with Snake River Wild um, due to what the forecast is and how close to the 200,000 mark. Um, and then uh, the plan is to have a one fish, one adult limit when open. The coho forecast is low as we presented earlier, so it has very limited harvest opportunity and likely um, only when Chinook is open. And then barbless hooks uh, are required when fishing for salmon steelhead up to the Oregon Washington state line. Let's take a look at some of the 2020 forecasts and proposed seasons for salmon and steelhead in region three. For the most part, fisheries in the region will look similar to last year with just a few changes. We'll start with spring Chinook for the Yakima River we're forecasting a return of just under 3,000 fish, which is similar to last year's forecast. With a return that low, we plan to take the same precautionary approach as we did last year and leave the fishery closed and closely monitor the return in season. If we do see a more abundant return, we'll consider opening a fishery. For summer Chinook, much like last year, we're looking at a very low return, so summer Chinook fishing will likely remain closed in the region. One change this year could be sockeye, though. The forecast for sockeye is strong enough to consider fisheries, but that is still being discussed, so stay tuned for more information on sockeye in the coming weeks. Moving on to fall Chinook, for Hanford Reach, the proposed fishery is much like last year. Both sections will open mid-August when most of the summer Chinook have moved out of the area and fall Chinook are starting to move in. We'll closely monitor the fishery in season to ensure we meet escapement goals, so be aware that there could be adjustments made depending on the actual return. One change from last year is likely fall Chinook on the Yakima River. The projected return of fall Chinook and coho to the Yakima is very low, so we're proposing leaving the fall salmon fishery in the lower river closed. That's the fishery that would traditionally open in early September. But if returns are higher than expected, we'll consider opening a fishery in season. And finally, steelhead. For Ringgold, we're proposing opening the fishery October 1, but we are taking a bit of a conservative approach because of the expected low return to the upper Columbia River. And we'll start the season with a daily limit of one hatchery steelhead. Only Ringgold hatchery steelhead, those fish with a, both a clipped adipose fin and a right ventral fin. Starting with spring Chinook. Typically we talk about the Icicle River here, but in the past we've occasionally opened up the Wenatchee River too. For 2020, Spring Chinook fishing will be closed in both the Icicle and Wenatchee Rivers. The forecast is just simply too low. To provide some perspective, the forecast for the Icicle River is optimistically around half of the broodstock needs. Like always, we'll monitor the run through the hydropower system and if we're really off on the forecast and higher abundance, abundances come in, we'll look to try and provide as much opportunity as we can. Moving on the summer Chinook, this is gonna be a to be determined. Uh, we will monitor the run through the hydropower system and in particular over Priest Rapids Dam. If the run seems to be shaping up with the preseason forecast or is maybe a little bit higher, we're likely to have similar seasons that we had in 2018 and 2019, which includes the Rocky Reach Pool. That also includes the Eniat and Chelan Rivers, as well as the Brewster Pool. Rocky Reach would likely open somewhere around mid-July. The Brewster Pool would likely open somewhere around early August. Um, potential daily limit would be like last year, six salmon, up to two hatchery adults, released wild adult Chinook and coho. The remaining um, balance of the daily limit can be made up of, of jacks, whether they're clipped or unclipped. We would also allow the use of two poles with a valid endorsement. And also like last year, barb hooks will be allowed as well. Uh, the only difference to the seasons there would be what we've done the last couple for the Inyat which is a little bit unique. We would just have a six fish limit. They could be clipped, unclipped, jacks, adults. And this is kind of the help with some adult management um, with removing summer Chinook that do um, superimpose upon ESA listed spring Chinook. So it's try to lessen the effect there. Next up is sockeye. Um, we're predicting a pretty large forecast this year. And that, based off that forecast, uh, the plan is to um, establish seasons um, 
in the pamphlet for that. We are still working through what dates and daily limits might be throughout the entire Columbia River, so there'll be more to come on that. Um, same with Wenatchee. Uh, we're predicting uh, not quite twice the escapement goal for Wenatchee, so we'll be looking at the Rock Island, Rocky Reach, inner dam counts, as well as passage over Tumwater to determine if we can do a season there. And just as reference, what we typically like to see is 28,000 enter into the lake with the knowledge that more fish are coming. That way we have our escapement in the lake and that we're providing a fishery um, off of 5,000 or more fish. Uh, this season is intensively monitored um, and will all be done through emergency regulation. Uh, one thing to note here that um, forecasting sockeye, we're really in our infancy doing this. We don't have a huge data set on this, maybe 10 years. And so as such, um, sometimes the forecast can be off by quite a bit. And so just as a warning to anglers up there that even though we may put this season in the pamphlet, that if the forecast does not come in as predicted and is much lower, um, there could be emergency closures in season um, and early into a season. So please note that for 2020. And finally, Fall Chinook. Um, we're talking about the Priest Rapids and Wanapum pools here, and that's pretty much targeting overshoot hatchery fish from Priest Rapids Hatchery. Um, both pools will be in the pamphlet opening up September 1st and running through October 15th. The daily limit is going to be six salmon, like the Hanford Reach. Um, up to two adults may be retained and then must release all other salmon. One thing to note here is because the salmon out of Priest Rapids Hatchery are not mass marked, this is a non-selective fishery. So salmon that have an adipose fin or a clipped adipose fin is allowed for retention. Uh, like for Summer Chinook, we're going to allow the use of two poles with a valid two pole endorsement and we'll be allowing barbed hooks as well. Anglers should expect to see something very similar to how we operated fisheries in 2019. That means that we will open areas around Little Goose Dam and then Clarkston for up to two days per week, preferably Saturdays and Sundays, to allow for anglers to get out and take advantage of what is a very small number of spring chinook that we have allotted for the Snake River fishery. The number of chinook for this fishery is somewhere around 400 fish. We don't anticipate, regardless of how we open fisheries, that anglers should expect to see more than one or two weekends of fishing before the, the number of fish allotted to the Snake River is harvested. The daily limit for spring Chinook fisheries in Region 1 on the Snake River will be six salmon daily, only one of which can be an adult. The remainder would be jacks. Anglers are reminded that if you retain your adult, you cannot continue to fish for jacks. Anglers should expect that we will manage both spring Chinook and fall Chinook on emergency regulations and that those rules will come out giving anglers plenty of time to anticipate when the openers will occur so that they will have time to adjust their schedules and participate. For fall Chinook fisheries in the Snake River, based on the preseason forecast, we plan to at least have an open mark selective fishery. Similar to 2019, if there are sufficient numbers of wild Chinook in the fishery, we will also be able to have a non-mark selective fishery. This will be based on adult returns, which at this point we are uncertain of, and we will wait until those fish start to pass Bonneville Dam to make those decisions coming in August and September. Anglers should also be aware that we may have to interrupt season structures and lengths based on adult steelhead returns as we anticipate that both A run and B run steelhead returns to the Snake River will be exceptionally weak and we may have to take additional conservation measures to avoid impacts to those fish. This leads me to discuss summer steelhead in the main stem Columbia, upper Columbia, and Snake River and tributaries. Anglers will recall that in 2017 and 2019, there were fishery limitations based on low B run forecasts. 
In 2020, we have exceptionally low A run and B run forecast with a slight uptick in the forecast for B runs. Having said that, unique to 2020, we continue to have hatchery escapement concerns for both A run and B run fish and basin wide concerns for A run hatchery and wild escapements. Anglers should expect that we will have limitations on fisheries from the mouth of the Columbia River all the way to the upper Columbia and the Snake River and tributaries. For the main stem Columbia River, anglers should anticipate seasons similar to 2017 and 2019. By that I mean rolling block closures progressing from the mouth of the Columbia in August and going upstream as the fish progress in their migration. There will be areas in the main stem of Columbia that remain closed for the entirety of the run from July through March, including night closures. For tributary mouths such as Drano Lake, which are thermal refuge areas for steelhead as they progress in their migration, these will be closed, similar to main stem rolling block closures. Anglers should not anticipate there being catch and release opportunity and there will be night closures in these thermal refuge areas. For steelhead fisheries on the Snake River, anglers should expect in some areas there to be no open fishing for steelhead and in others abbreviated seasons, meaning timing and or limits can be adjusted based on adult abundance. Because we anticipate exceptionally low runs of both A and B run steelhead into the Snake River, we will be managing steelhead fisheries with emergency rules based on passage of adult steelhead over Bonneville, then following them over McNary and ultimately over Lower Granite. When we think there are sufficient abundances to offer harvest opportunities, we will do so. For anglers that fish for steelhead in the past above Priest Rapids Dam or in tributaries to the main stem Columbia above Priest Rapids Dam, do not anticipate fisheries occurring this year for summer steelhead. As a whole, if you are a steelhead angler in the Columbia Basin, you should expect that 2020 will not be normal from a fishery perspective. There will be areas closed, there will be areas closed to fishing for steelhead, and there will be abbreviated limits. As we see how adults return into the system, we will shape fisheries that can fit in opportunity with conservation driving the fishery. Please be patient as we see how things develop over the summer and we eke out opportunity where we can. We understand the frustration that anglers will feel because of the limited amount of steelhead fishing opportunity that we are able to allow in 2020. We will do our best based on adult abundance to offer opportunity wherever we can within the bounds of conservation. We hope that ocean conditions turn around soon and we see better conditions for adult returns in the coming years. So thank you for following along on this presentation. Staff put uh, quite a bit of energy and, and effort into providing this presentation, so we hope it was of value to you. We do place a very high value on your comments, so please do provide those. Staff will review those and take those into consideration through the rulemaking process. So please, again, as a, another reminder, provide your comment through the link provided. And we wish you a best season and stay healthy out there.